First of all, thank you Neil and James Cook University for having me here. I'm just, I just feel really honoured to get to share a space with Neil to, share, to talk about what I do as well. Um, and I really love sharks a lot, so I was, my heart was beating so fast as I was listening to Neil's lecture and I was like, oh, this is so exciting stuff, I just love hearing about sharks all the time. And that's, that's what led me to what I'm doing right now, which I'm going to talk about today. So if I can just ask a very quick question, which probably you know the answer already because Neil kind of talked about it just now. Um, do you know what species of shark that is? Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a whale shark. So um, this picture wasn't taken by me but it's taken by someone who I look up to a lot. If I can just shoot another quick question. Sorry, I just really like to ask questions a lot. So yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, how many of you have environmental superheroes? Somebody you look up to because they do great work in conservation or whatever environmental field they do. Any names to throw out? Silver Eel, yeah, I love her. Yeah, anybody else? Um, sorry, I'm not too familiar with that name, <laughs> but I will. Oh, okay, cool. Any other names? Brian Scary. Brian Scary. Oh, I, I love him too. Yeah, so I think all of us have somebody we look up to in terms of conservation. And um, Leslie Rocha is just one of the many people I look up to. Um, and yeah, so she's basically a shark conservationist in South Africa. And I use this photo to start my presentations usually. Not because, um, okay, obviously I didn't take this picture, this is her picture. But this also reminds me of um, something that led me to what I'm doing today. And it was actually an encounter I had with a whale shark. Any of you ever swam with a whale shark before? Yeah, I see some of you nodding. That's great. I love the experience I had with a whale shark and that was in Exmouth in Western Australia. And I think um, that that experience I had, I remember the moment I jumped out of the boat into the, into the, into the Indian Ocean, just off the Ningaloo Reef, um, just looking at the whale shark through my snorkel lens, I just started crying because it was one of the most beautiful things I ever saw in my life. So I am coming from an emotional perspective about sharks. I really do love them a lot. I really do love seeing them. And um, yeah, and after I had that experience with the shark, it got me thinking about all the things people say about sharks. What are some things we know about sharks, like um, movies from Hollywood? What was that one shark that made a lot of difference to sharks in a bad way? Jaws. Yeah, Jaws. And what was, what was the impressions that Jaws has given us about sharks? Sharks are monsters, they kill people, they eat people, and they're really scary. You should kill them first before they kill you. And I started hearing a lot of this from um, a lot of people I started talking to. But when I started to think about my experience and all the things that people were saying about sharks, there was this disconnect and I wanted to do something about it. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. I used to be a secondary school teacher. No, I have no marine science background. I'm sorry. Um, but I used to be a history teacher. And back then when I was a teacher, I, I already started diving with sharks and I loved them a lot. So I would always talk to my students about sharks and the, and the encounters I had with sharks. In fact, I'll show you a video later that I took when I was in Malapasqua about the thresher sharks. And yeah, with all the things that I shared with my students, I just started to feel like a hypocrite after se seven years of talking to my students about it. And I felt that I wasn't doing enough. That's why I wanted to step out and um, start the dorsal effect. So just at, towards the last year of my teaching career, I started to volunteer at Shark Savers and that's where I went around talking to students and um, talking to people about sharks and why it's important for you to conserve them and not eat them. And uh, I felt that it's important to talk about it on the demand side because Singapore is one of the hub for shark fin soup. But I also wanted to do more on the supply side and that's why I started the dorsal effect. So basically, if I can just give you a little bit of background, um, I saw a Facebook post um, about sharks that were being caught in Lombok. So this was in Tanjung Lua itself. And um, after seeing that Facebook post, I was more appalled by the comments that were being made because people were saying a lot of horrible things about the fishermen. They were saying things like, oh, these fishermen are terrible. A lot of expletives were used and they started to say um, hurl a lot of words um, that were very mean towards the fishermen. Of course, if you see sharks that are being killed, you tend to get angry and you tend to react. And I think that's the problem with social media. We react very quickly as keyboard warriors. So I started to get curious. I love sharks. No, I don't like to see them dead. But I was also curious to find out more about the situation. So one of my school holidays, I actually went down to Lombok back then when I was still teaching. And um, any of you know where Lombok is? Yeah, it's close to this island that's a little bit more popular. 
which is Bali. yeah Bali. So Bali has many tourists. Lombok also has tourists, maybe not as much as Bali, but it's about five to six times the size of Singapore. And um, okay, this screen is really huge. So Tanjong Luo is here, if you can see. Yeah, so that's the fish market where I went to to find out more about the shark situation there. People are telling me that Tanjung Loa was the second biggest uh, shark market in Indonesia. So I guess with a Singaporean mentality about how development is, I went there thinking that, oh, this shark market is very structured, it's huge, it's um, very well, well set out. And this was what I saw when I went to Tanjung Loa. Yeah, dirty um, boats. The, okay, so yeah, basically this is what the port looked like, but this is the second biggest shark landing site in Indonesia. So those are the shark boats that you see in the background. And it's one th thing to look at sharks dead um, through pictures. It was quite another to actually be there and see the sharks being landed. Anybody knows what species these sharks are? <laughs> yeah, so these are the big eyed threshers. Am I correct? <laughs> I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need to, because they're saying this here, so I feel a little bit um, un uh, like, yeah, I, I feel that I should, I should be more careful about what I say <laughs> in terms of the sharks that, are, that I see there. So yeah, it was quite, a, quite, quite appalling for me to see something like that, to actually see um, sharks being landed. And the one thing about being there, instead of looking at pictures, is that the smell of death kind of lingers in you for a few days. I couldn't wash off that smell. I just broke down and cried when I saw the shark landing site in Tanjung Luo the first time I was there. I still go back a lot. Um, there are times where I still get emotional about it because as a diver, you just really want to see sharks. They are really beautiful things to see underwater. But to see them dead is quite another thing altogether. So this was what was happening in Tanjung Luo. They would take the fins and they would re-export it to places like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Um, the rest of the shark gets eaten locally as well. So what happens is they would process the shark meat um, to be made into fish balls or shark satay. Um, the skin will be made into crackers. So kind of like they use up the whole shark. Whether is that sustainable or not, I really don't know because sharks, um, as you heard from news talk, they have long gestation periods and they give birth to few pups each time. So are we overfishing the oceans of, the, of sharks? I do wonder. And these are the things that you see happening on a daily basis. This happens every day in Tanjung Luo, actually. So the first time I was there, I saw this sign there. It kind of basically just says that you cannot catch dolphins and you cannot catch thresher sharks. Um, of course, thresher sharks were caught, as you saw in my first picture about um, the sharks in Tanjung Luo. And you can see that the poster is defaced. So I think there was regulation that was happening, yes. But I think the problem is enforcement. Nobody was actually going there enough to find out if this is happening or not. Because a few months after I took this photo, there was no sign of this poster anywhere anymore. And they actually used dolphin meat to bait the sharks in um, Lombok. So this is one picture that kind of makes me think about my childhood, like when I was a little girl. As a Chinese girl in Singapore, chances are, are you would have ate, eaten um, shark fin soup before. So when I look at this picture, I start to think about the times I've eaten shark fin soup as a girl, as a little girl. And um, do I actually know what speci species of shark was in my bowl of soup? I don't think I ever knew. And the thing about Singapore is, I guess, um, there are regulations internationally in terms of what sharks can be imported and what cannot. But after you process a fin for the shark fin soup industry, um, you can't really tell what species it is anymore and DNA testing to determine that is just too expensive. I don't think any government would actually want to spend that kind of money. So with that, I went to the shark market and I started talking to the fishermen. I just sat down uh, with them for a few days over a period of a few months and I found out that, hey, I found out a lot more about shark hunting and I'll show you an infographic later that tells you a little bit more about it. But um, the whole reason why I wanted to go down to Tanjung Luo was I wanted to see if there was a way they could have an alternative source of livelihood instead of shark hunting. And after speaking to them for a while, they started to tell me that, yeah, there are some um, snorkeling sites just off Tanjung Luo where you can go snorkeling and it, the reefs are really beautiful. And that's where I thought, hey, how about if I paid you money to take people out snorkeling instead of hunting sharks? Yeah, so <clears throat> that was the solution I was trying to work around with. And yeah, so basically, shark hunting in Tanjong Luo is um, what happens is the fishermen actually have to 
borrow money, they have to be in debt to get the fuel, to get the bait, to get the equipment they need before they can go out to the open oceans for a few weeks. We're not talking about a few days, it's a few weeks. And then uh, when they set off um, shark hunting, of course, there's no guarantee that the boats will return with sharks. The fishermen will try to sh sell their sharks at Tanjong Lua. They make, if they are lucky, they make anything between um, 30 to 100 USD for each catch. If you continue hunting the sharks, I don't know how sustainable that is. And that is also why data is very important in terms of conservation. We can, we can say that maybe we might overhunt the fish, the, the sharks, but if we don't have the data, it's very hard to determine that for sure. So I wanted to come in and I tell them that if, I, if you take tourists out um, um, snorkeling, you can make a little bit more from it. I'll pay you $150 for just one day out snorkeling. You take them out snorkeling, you make a lot more from a few weeks of shark hunting, which is a gamble actually. You can go out shark hunting, but you may or may not catch anything. And I was hearing a lot of stories from the fishermen as well. They were sharing me things about how um, there was this one particular fisherman who went uh, shark hunting. He was away for a few weeks. After he came back, his wife actually left him for somebody else. He's just away for too long, and that was the reality of what was happening there. So we went um, out on the boats, and basically these were some of the sites that we saw in um, just off Tanjung Lua itself, like maybe a half an hour, an hour or so boat, right? It was just beautiful. Like I remember the first boat trip we went to, the snorkeling sites were just so pristine, and there was a lot of marine life there. See a lot of damsel fishes. I don't know if you can see what's hiding under the corals, but do you know what that is? Yeah, moray eel. They're quite cute, actually. And yeah, we see a lot of anemones and clownfishes, knobbly sea stars at the intertidal walk. So it was quite amazing what we were seeing, and I, I was thinking, it's, this is, these are sites just off the fish, fish market. You see so much death happening at the fish market. You take a boat out and you see so much stuff going on. So there was that. Like, why? why? Why wasn't enough people capitalizing on that? I was thinking to myself. So with the Dorsal Effect, I really wanted to come in to offer them a triple bottom line. Um, in terms of socially and culturally, they didn't need to learn something new. They basically just used their boats and they're already so in tune with the oceans. So they can, they can free dive, they can swim, they can lead the snorkeling tours. Um, in terms of economically, I'm trying to pay them more than shark hunting itself. Environmentally as well, I try to have regulations when the tourists come on the boat trips snorkeling with me. I try to tell them that let's pick up trash along the way. Please do not kick the corals. Please try to use reef safe sunscreen that doesn't bleach the corals. Yeah, so when I started this, I really started with just whatever money I had in my bank account. And I just went forth with a lot of naivety and idealism, thinking that I could change Lombok maybe in two years' time, and then move on to more shark markets and convert as many shark markets as I can. Of course, that's not the reality because three and a half years on, I'm still stuck in Lombok. Shark hunting is still happening there. And I've learned so much in that process about how conservation can be really long drawn. But the good thing is I've also met a lot of people there and um, in Singapore as well as there. So maybe I'd like to share a little bit more about the highlights of the journey rather than the challenges that make me cry most of the time. So I don't really want to cry here right now today. So yeah, one of it was I started to learn more about um, reef safe sunscreen. I don't know if you know what's that, um, what, what is the chemical that is in sunscreen that bleaches corals? Anybody has any idea? Yeah, so oxybenzone is this chemical that can bleach corals. So if it washes off your body, you keep on leaking it onto the corals, it kind of damages it. That's why I wanted to get people um, to use reef safe sunscreen on the snorkeling trips with us. If they don't buy it, I try to provide it for them as well. I was also lucky enough to have an underwater photographer, a really young guy, um, Andrew Lim, who came on a boat trip and he said, I really want to take some photos for you. Take me diving to the snorkeling sites that you go to and I'll help you to take some photos. And I think his photos were just amazing. I look at his camera, it's huge. It's like a $20,000 camera that I can never afford. But when I look at the photos, I was just blown away by them. <laughs> I showed you a picture of the clownfishes. This is his picture of the clownfishes. So, yeah, sometimes good gear really makes a difference, I guess. And then I had Caroline Pang. She's a conservation photographer. She came down and she took some photos as well. So when I go to the fish market, I try to go to the schools around it too, to talk to them about um, shark conservation. They are aware. These schools already have it in their curriculum. about They know about marine life, but there's a little bit of a disconnect in terms of what they learn in the school and what they have off their coast. They don't really link it together. 
and that's where I try to come in and talk to them and hopefully get them to see that they have very good marine life just off their coast as well and get them excited about conservation for their own waters too. So I had this um, pair of um, Australians who came and they donated some snorkel gear for the children just so that they get a chance to see what's happening in their own waters. And apart from tourists, I also started to get schools to come on marine um, conservation trips, so service and science trips, and School of Science and Technology was a, a school that came. It was quite, uh, quite intense to have 25 heads bobbing in, in the water at each of the snorkel sites. I think at some point the teachers actually freaked out and they were like on the boats and trying to count the heads and it's almost impossible to count people when they're in the water. But yeah, everything went off without a glitch anyway. And I actually got them to work together for another NGO, which was Gili Eco Trust, um, to build Biorox. Do you know what Biorox are? Maybe some of you do. Yeah. So, uh, okay. so Biorox are basically structures that you place in the water near reefs to help uh, regenerate coral growth. And they are actually powered up by car batteries usually. So as they came, they work with Gili Eco Trust, they built this structure and it's actually, if you can tell, if you're familiar with School of Science and Technology, it's built in the shape of their school logo. And yeah, so they tie some um, corals, hard corals, onto the bar rock and it will keep growing and growing. So it, it kind of helps to regenerate coral growth. So every time I go back to Lombok, I try to take a picture of the progress of the bar rock to send it back to the school. Yeah, so that they know how, how their corals are, are faring, the ones that they're trying to replant. This is a picture of uh, Suhadi. He's basically one of the fishermen who's with me. And I took this picture because, uh, and I used this picture because Suhardi is someone who also, um, um, like he gets excited about having tourists on a boat trip. So when I tell the tourists to pick up trash on the reefs, on the beaches, Suhardi is always the first who would go deeper than everybody else just to pick the trash, just so that he doesn't have to trouble the tourists to do it. So it's very heartening to see how they have come around to liking ecotourism as an alternative. Um, shark tagging is something that I'm really not familiar with as well, at, at all. So it was very, it's, it's good to hear about Neil talking about tagging. And um, there was once I was working with some SMU students, um, Singapore Management University, and they were giving me this idea about, hey, why don't you have a shark tagging model for the dorsal effect? Get the fishermen, train them to tag the sharks. And then same thing, also app-based, get people to adopt a shark through the app so that the money can go back to the fishermen and they make money from that instead, from the tracking of the shark rather than the hunting of the sharks. Of course, I don't have the resources for that and I don't think I know enough about shark tagging yet. I need to learn a little bit more about it before this can take off. So I've kind of shelved this idea, even though I liked it a lot, a lot when the students were recommending it to me. And um, I was also lucky to have a group of uh, Singapore Management University scholars coming on a trip. So I got them to do some ethnographic surveys with the fishermen. So they're sitting down with the fishermen to find out more about their livelihood. What did they feel about ecotourism? What did they think were other alternatives we could look at? Because ecotourism is kind of not really sustainable enough. They also sat down with the children and that's where they find out, that's where we found out that these, um, these children don't really know a lot about the snorkel sites that we go to. Yeah, so this actually leads up to something else which I'll talk about with another school that we brought. I've also been lucky to have a marine biologist with me right now because I don't have the marine science background. Naomi has been a great help to me. She created these educational charts and sheets about the sharks that you see landed at the shark market as well as some of the, um, the marine life that we see at the snorkel sites. We, we also talk about marine trash and how it affects um, people. I mean, how it affects marine life. And she also led a group of uh, Yale and US students. We were lucky to win some grant from um, Ruffert. So uh, we started to do some coral health checks at the snorkel sites that we go to. And Naomi has been leading this group of Yale and US students to do coral health checks. This is something that we hope to do on a regular long-term basis. Um, because data is important and we don't have a lot of data about the coral of the sites at all. But we figured that it would be good to find out if there's any impact. It could be climate change, it could be because of more tourists coming into these areas. But we wanted to see if it affects the health of the corals, as well as does it affect the marine life that we see there. Yeah, so in January, we had uh, International School Singapore coming on a service and science trip. And that's where they started to bring the students out snorkeling. The students that you saw earlier in the... In the um, in the interviews that were done with the SMU students. 
and they also did some shark landing surveys as well. So this was a typical day at the shark market and the students were there to learn from Wildlife Conservation Society who has been doing a lot of tagging of the sharks, uh, the tracking of the shark landings there for about the last three years. So I guess for me, um, I'm thinking also about the extension of what I'm trying to do in terms of can there be more varied marine conservation programs? We pick up so much trash on a boat trip. Can this trash be converted into something useful? I think there are organizations that try to um, make trash into ornamental things. I'm not really for ornamental things. I'm really wondering if this trash can be made into things that are useful. Um, and as I talked about marine tagging and documentation as well. I've been thinking about legislation because Wildlife Conservation Society has, been, has so much data of the sharks that are landed there after being there for so long. But I've been speaking to Wildlife Conservation Society and, be, and we've been thinking about um, how, how to ensure that there's a marine protected zone in Lombok itself. But when I asked them about the feasibility of it, they would look at me matter of factly and they would say, mm, in Indonesia, maybe it'll take you about 15 years before you can declare a place a marine protected zone. And I'm thinking to myself, like, do the sharks have 15 years? It's, yeah, so, so, so that's when I realized that conservation can be a long and tiring process sometimes. And I guess what always, what's always at the back of my head is, can ecotourism always be sustainable and responsible? Sometimes I feel like um, I might be causing more damage. Sure, I can tell the tourists that they have to be more careful about how they snorkel, about the sunscreen that they use. But humans always have an impact. And when I think back about um, that whole thing about, bum is it bumblebees? Yeah, bumblebees. Uh, are they the most damaging species? I think probably not. I think there's a more damaging species and that's called humans. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we always have impacts. Do we want to leave negative or positive impacts? It's always so much easier for us to leave negative impacts though, unfortunately. Yeah, so this process has been very... Okay, I will not use this slide. I, I don't really want to talk about it now. But yeah, um, when I talk about the extension of what I'm trying to do, I, I, I mentioned that I've been in Lombok for the last three years. I feel like I've been pulled and sucked into Lombok for so long. I've always wanted to reach out to Taiwan. So I actually went to Taiwan uh, in September and I was horrified by the scale of it. I was already horrified in Lombok. But when I went to Taiwan, the scale is so much bigger. You see huge liners. They're out at sea for like a year, two years, and they bring in chongs like that. It's just truckloads and truckloads of sharks and their fins, and they cut away the heads. So you can't really tell what species of sharks have been caught. And I was just so shocked out of my system after this trip that I really don't know how am I going to pro progress in Taiwan itself. So yeah, that's just to share. Um, Okay, if I can... Oops! <laughs> okay, before we get to this, uh, I just really wanted to show you a video. I think many of you have watched this video before. It's made in rounds. It's rounds on Facebook a couple of times. Um, but I still want to show it because... Um, after watching this video, obviously I cried again. But it also started to make me think about my habits. And yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about it after you watch the whole thing. So a marine NGO actually found this turtle off Costa Rica and yeah, something was stuck in its nose. Yeah, it looks painful.
Yeah, so this video actually made me change my habits and I never wanted to touch another plastic straw in my life. And that's also why I started bringing my own metal straw around everywhere I go. I, I think about all the trash that we pick up in Lombok and I started bringing my own chopsticks, my own shopping bag, my own lunchbox. I like bubble tea a lot still, but I always get them to put it in my, um, in my metal container now. And yeah, I mean, for me it was, I started thinking a lot about it. Like I started on the dorsal effect of a love for sharks. But as I, I delved deeper and deeper into the issues of the ocean, I started to realise that everything is interconnected. The trash that we throw away, the, the plastics that we use that's so convenient for us, we never know where it goes and if it goes up and if it ends up in the ocean, we cause so much damage to the marine life. So I just really wanted to end with um, talking about what kind of change can we make. Um, it doesn't just take scientists to make a difference. I think everybody has a part to play in the oceans and maybe it's about time we start changing our habits instead of thinking about convenience, there's a lot of other things that we can do as well. I didn't want to end with something so sad as well. Um, maybe if I could just show you a video, I don't know how to do it, but I'll try. So this is a video I took when I was diving in Malapascua in Philippines. Um, that's a thresher shark. I showed you a dead thresher shark earlier. I wanted to end with a live thresher shark. They're amazing creatures. I don't know enough about them yet, but one thing about their long tails, why they have um, caudal fins that are so long is because they use it for um, stunning fishes so that they can feed. Yeah, so I took this video when I was diving in Malapascua. Uh, about 20 meters, I had to wake up at about 4 a.m. for the dive and they'll go to this cleaning station and just circle around. You can't really see in my video, but there are some cleaner rests that are actually trying to eat the parasites off the thresher sharks. So there are a lot of symbiotic relationships that goes on in the oceans and that's what makes the oceans, sharks and everything else in it so amazing. Yeah, so with that, um, thank you for giving me the time to talk about the dorsal effect. Thank you.